Fortunate for us, we can look at the monarch butterflies, we can look at the sea turtles, we can look at the whales, put that all together and build the best system and be able to navigate anywhere in the world. Are the navigational skills hidden in a bird's brain more complex than our best computers? In terms of the animal kingdom, they have figured it out. For us now, it's to understand how to decipher how they do that so that we can put it back into our robot. Exploring the outer reaches of the universe. Exploring the inner reaches of the human body. Wild Tech explores navigation. The sun, the moon, the stars, Ancient mariners and nature relied on these perpetual celestial navigation tools to guide them to new lands on epic voyages of discovery. Humankind's inventiveness has replaced the vagaries of celestial navigation with the accuracy of global positioning satellites. Radio signals from three or more satellites allow accurate latitude and longitude calculation. Navigating the great oceans is now child's play, allowing accurate fixes no matter what the weather. In the monster seas of the southern ocean, plotting your precise position can mean the difference between life and death. In 1997, when round the world yachtsman Tony Bullimore overturned his craft, he spent six days adrift inside the hull. Three out of four of his GPS distress beacons had failed. Bullimore was lucky. When I saw this ship standing there and the plane going over the top, and, and a couple of guys you know, peering over the top of the upturned hull is a miracle. Bullimore's rescuers needed to scour the ocean, risking life and limb to zero in on his faint signal. In future, remote rescue workers will be aided by a new technology which draws from the lessons of nature. There certainly are some parallels with the animal kingdom. A lot of our people who are writing the software for these aircraft have based some of their initial algorithms um, or software code on things that happen in the animal world. Animals are very big on cooperating, such as bees in telling each other where the hives are, ants in telling each other where the source of food are, geese in terms of navigating where they're going to fly. It's this sort of synergism that we're hoping to utilise in the aircraft. Migrating birds rely on a combination of factors to drive them to their breeding grounds. On their first migration, young birds use their elders as guides as they travel with the flock. This is the key to their navigation, part instinct, mostly learning. A lesson which scientists at the Key Robotics Center at Australia's Sydney University in partnership with BAE Systems, are keen to emulate. They're building a flock of intelligent flying vehicles 
with the same learning abilities as migratory species. Not the actual aircraft themselves that are special, but it's the things on board, what we call the payload. So it's the computers, and in particular the software, or the algorithms they run, and what they can do. Okay, that's good. In this particular case, is that we're trying to avoid using GPS for navigation of the aircraft. GPS, or Global Positioning System, is not going to be available all the time in all the applications that we're looking at. Underwater and underground, GPS is never available. In a military application, GPS may be turned off or it may be jammed. So what we're trying to do is to work out how to navigate without using GPS. OK, Dave, you're clear for takeoff. These aircraft familiarise themselves with landscape rather than relying on GPS. The way the technology works is very similar to the way that you navigate if you walk into an unfamiliar building or a room. You walk through the door and you take note of the fact that you've got the, the edge of the door, which might be a, a prominent feature in that room. There might be a window, um, a piece of furniture. And you move around the room and you note subconsciously your position relative to those uh, features in the room. And the computers on board the aircraft are doing a very similar thing. A speed 75, altitude 445. They're looking at dominant features on the ground. They note the position of the feature. As they move past the feature, they note the position of other features. They build up the location of those features on a map which is stored on the computer. And when they return to the same area, they look at the feature again, and by looking at its relative position, they're able to, de to determine the position of the aircraft. OK, taking off now. Stu, ready for autonomous? Enabling autonomous mode. Going autonomous. As the unmanned aerial vehicles fly over a new landscape, they detect landmarks using radar, sonar, infrared, laser, and magnetic sensors. Altitude 450. This information is fed into their brains the sophisticated software for exchanging and analyzing data, allowing the craft to navigate and generate maps entirely on their own. The laser on the aircraft is used to tell the camera system how far away it is from the targets. With an ordinary camera, it tells you the angle to the target, but it doesn't tell you the distance. If we have both the angle and the distance information, then we can determine the position of the target on the ground. How's the height and speed? Altitude 470. It's able to share the information gained from those sensors with other aircraft and build up a, a complete map. Just like birds travelling in flock, completing some of nature's most extraordinary global journeys. Once learned, these birds will be able to complete the annual migration on autopilot. The quest for navigation technology is to deliver the same efficiency of knowledge sharing. The objective of the next uh, phase of this uh, project is to be able to send an aircraft out on a mission so that it's able to build its own map and uh, perform its uh, a mission objective and then return uh, without using any GPS information. And we're also developing technologies so that that map can then be shared with other aircraft and other aircraft can also navigate using the same map. If robotic planes prove to be as effective learners as animals, then a high-tech flock of remote vehicles may one day become a welcome sight for sailors lost at sea. They're taking water rapidly. We can't get the motor started to start the pumps. Getting the lifeboats on deck. Imagine a fleet of tiny aircraft capable of conducting search missions entirely on their own, in conditions too dangerous for helicopters or light aircraft. Okay. 
These autonomous vehicles navigate through the perils of a storm without putting more lives at risk. If any one of them spots a missing yacht, all aircraft will converge on the area, relaying coordinates and monitoring the vessel until the rescue. Squadrons of these small and smart planes will be able to scan thousands of miles with unprecedented speed and accuracy. And their range of applications isn't limited to maritime use. There are a number of applications uh, for this technology and a lot of them are not in an aerospace environment, but actually in a land environment. One example is search and rescue where robots are required to enter collapsed buildings or tunnels and search for people. Another application is where a miniature aircraft, not much larger than your hand, will be able to fly into buildings and build up maps and go into areas that are hostile to uh, human beings. Building intelligent technologies capable of navigating autonomously on Earth brings us one step closer to self-guided navigation on the surface of our nearest planet. The sun is the principal navigation aid of both man and animals. Its clockwork regularity of rising in the east and setting in the west gives a perpetual reference point. Birds migrating northwards in the northern hemisphere know to keep the sun behind them by keeping the sun to the right in the morning then to the left in the afternoon, the bird is able to keep to its northerly flight path. Even when the sun is obscured by cloud, many of these sun-seeking creatures will calculate the position of the sun by detecting the angle of the polarized light passing through the atmosphere. For all the sophisticated computers, sensors, and satellite positioning systems, Human technology barely equals the navigational power of a bird's tiny brain. In terms of the animal kingdom, they have figured it out. For us now, it's to understand how to decipher how they do that so that we can put it back into our robot. Mother Nature has the answer. It's just to us to get those answers and translate them into technology. The next generation of planetary robotic explorers need to think like birds. There is no GPS, nor even magnetic poles on other planets. A robot named Hyperion will navigate by following the sun, just like a bird. Hyperion is what we call a test bed. It's basically a robot, a platform that we will use to test new navigation, you know, new uh, ways of uh, going around obstacles or new ways of doing science. Robots are, for the time being, surrogate geologists that we send on another planet. So we are trying to have them do as much as we would be doing if we were going to Mars. Time has been doing on Mars what it did on Earth. You know, bring layer upon layer upon layer of different materials. And this has deposited sediments and rocks. This is this diversity that we need to explore if we want to understand Mars and its environment. And this is also why we need to learn how to navigate with robots so that we can go from one target to the other and also achieve long ranges, long distances, because you won't understand the global history of Mars by staying in one place. To be able to drive on Mars, you have to have a very smart robot. You need to have a robot which understands what's in front of him, 
capable of avoiding obstacles because you cannot communicate very often with the Earth. So your robot needs to understand how to go from point A to point B without avoiding being in trouble. So this is a very smart piece of equipment. Hyperion varies its navigation according to the sun's direction. Even avoiding shadows on the Martian landscape to constantly replenish its solar cells. This allows Hyperion to conduct non-stop exploration and avoid the extreme colds of the Martian night. In 2003, we uh, took Hyperion to the Atacama Desert, which is basically the driest place uh, uh, on Earth, and very similar in many respects to, to Mars. So it's important to bring a platform like Hyperion there. And our goal with Hyperion in the Atacama is to do what we call now robotic astrobiology. Hyperion plots its initial position using a sophisticated combination of either star, sun, or terrain landmark sighting, and compares this to its own measurements of distance traveled. One of the achievements of Hyperion was to demonstrate a six kilometer traverse uh, using sun synchronous navigation. So it's really the new generation of robot. The key to Hyperion's navigation is a pair of digital cameras which act as its eyes. Images from the cameras are monitored by laser line scanners, which detect upcoming obstacles. A third camera produces panoramic images of the landscape, which is transmitted to remote observers. You have beautiful landscape that remind us very much of the Earth. Ancient rivers, valleys, dune fields, polar caps, volcanoes. Everything is there on Mars that we know on Earth, except maybe for the scale, it's often much bigger than on Earth, which is really interesting because Mars is about half the size of the Earth. Long range rovers will come. Uh, we will start with several kilometers, but in order to understand the planet, we'll have to go hundreds of kilometers. And if we are lucky, maybe we'll find these trace, you know, traces of life over there. I really hope so. Hyperion's navigational skills demonstrate that it takes years of constant scientific research to mimic the natural talents of earthly creatures. Science is slowly unraveling nature's secrets and creating the most remarkable applications for them including the ability to navigate deep within the human body. The greatest navigators known are those that function in mysterious ways. They don't rely on the sun, the stars, or even technology. They know where they are, even when in places they've never been to before. The greatest navigators are born with a sixth sense. It's autumn on the east coast of the United States, and an extraordinary journey is about to begin. of monarch butterflies are ready for an epic migration covering 2,500 miles en route to a mild winter in Mexico. Each butterfly is traveling to a place it has never seen before, a place of its ancestors. It takes at least three generations before monarchs complete their epic journey. On this reproductive death run, females lay their eggs daily along the route. Some scientists believe the monarch can orient by sensing the sun, but others now believe these butterflies use an inbuilt magnetic compass to find their way. 
many creatures, from turtles and sharks to pigeons and the butterfly, navigate by sensing the Earth's magnetic field, the same energy that is detected by a compass. The ions in the atmosphere generate a magnetic field that surrounds the Earth. This is created by the movement of liquid iron at the Earth's core. Animals which possess magnetic sense are able to identify strengths in the magnetic field and use them to accurately navigate long distances. Small crystals of magnetite in their brain align with magnetic fields and act like microscopic compass needles. Magnetic field navigation has opened a new direction for science. Not for navigating the world, but for navigating inside the human body. What's so unique about it is that we are using a force other than the muscle power of the surgeon to manipulate instruments inside the body. In this case, we're using uh, externally applied magnetic fields that are very precisely controlled. This cutting-edge technology allows surgeons to enter the most sensitive parts of a patient without invasive surgery. Using a guide wire and catheter to quickly and accurately drive tiny instruments through complex pathways, positioning surgical devices where previously they couldn't go. Currently, to treat one of the 80,000 patients diagnosed each year with a life-threatening aneurysm, neurosurgeons must enter the brain through a hole in the skull and manually push a rigid needle in a straight line through the soft tissue of the brain to reach the area needing attention. This patient has presented with an abnormal tangle of brain blood vessels. This particular one is in the left temporal lobe, which is in a very critical location because it's the left temporal lobe that controls a lot of the speech functions that allow a person to interpret words, read, and, and uh, formulate speech. What we think the magnetic stereotaxis device is going to allow us to do is to guide very precisely a magnetic catheter all the way along this route and deliver glue or other embolization materials to the center of the malformation, blocking these little blood vessels off. To navigate the magnetic tool through the patient's body, a small incision is first made in the groin to provide access to the femoral artery leading to the brain. A digital fluoroscope imaging system gives the surgeon a target. Then the patient's head is positioned in a machine containing superconducting magnets. A guide wire with tiny magnets directs a plastic catheter no bigger than a tube of spaghetti. The surgeon uses a mouse to direct the top of the magnetic guide wire. The computer pushes it a fraction of an inch at a time through four feet of twisted pathways to reach the brain. The magnetic field's contours are determined by the strength of the current flowing between three superconducting magnets. Increasing or decreasing the current to one of the magnets alters the contours of the field and with it the direction in which the small magnet moves. Once the target area of the brain is reached, the guide wire is withdrawn. This leaves the catheter in place to provide a tunnel for neurosurgeons to insert instruments. When we did it on the first patient, we sort of had this moment where we said, God, this thing really works. And uh, it was very exciting as we were watching the catheter track to its target. But, uh, we really think that we've made a lot of progress with this device and it's very exciting. 
In the world of navigation, nature has much to offer technology. The world's smallest microbes may hold the solution to navigating even the most dangerous of territories. Salmon begin their remarkable odyssey when young fish leave the freshwater streams where they hatched, then move thousands of miles to the open ocean. They return as adults to spawn in their natal stream. To navigate home again, they must first locate the coastline they're seeking then find the specific stream from which they began their life. Young salmon have the chemical signature of their birth waters imprinted on their brain. Even if the course of the river changes, the salmon's finely tuned sense of smell allows them to find their way home. battling their way upstream to their ancestral spawning grounds in Alaska, salmon swim against the force of white water spilling down to the sea. They are met by grizzlies who know the timing of the salmon season like clockwork. Running the gauntlet of the grizzlies is like navigating a minefield. Some traverse successfully for others, it costs them their lives. The acute olfactory sense in fish has scientists thinking about how technology can utilize chemical senses for navigating, in this case, real minefields. Dr. Robert Berlage, working at Oak Ridge National Labs in Tennessee, has been investigating the use of bacteria as a chemical detector. On discovering a strain of bacteria which responds to the explosive TNT, Bob was able to explore the potential use of microbes for detecting one of war's most insidious legacies, landmines. He genetically engineered the TNT munching bacteria with a fluorescent green protein derived from jellyfish. Whenever the bacterium responds to TNT, it thinks it's turning on the genes that will eat that substance as a meal. Instead, it's turning on the genes that we're interested in and becomes fluorescent. And this is the negative control for it. It hasn't been sprayed. When these microbes are in the presence of their explosive food, they glow fluorescent green. This can't be seen under normal light conditions, but a laser camera picks the TNT-hungry microbes easily. Where there's a glow, there's a mine. Finding new ways to navigate through the perils of a minefield is crucial. You got it it's right there. Like all ordnance, landmines are also becoming smarter and more difficult to detect with conventional metal detectors. Most likely we have a stacked array of mines here. And what that means is the detonator would be removed from the top mine where we have no metallic signature and then we have mines underneath that are armed. So if you apply pressure, you'll get click, click, and then the one underneath will detonate and all three of them will go. The current mine clearance methods, it's a very slow, laborious process. And what's more, you can look at huge tracts of land that have no mines on them at all, and which people still have to cover in that very laborious fashion. With the method that we've developed, we have the opportunity to examine those very, very quickly and tell whether, yes, there are some mines there, this area should be looked at, or no, there are no mines here at all. 
Even minute quantities of TNT leaching out of unexploded mines can be detected by these hungry microbes. But best of all, this chemical technology can be easily deployed by spraying a bacteria-rich soup over the minefield. For instance, if you wanted to just do a road, you could go down the side of the road well, that you, you knew was free from mines and spray it with a hand sprayer. For the future, what we'd like to do is load this onto crop dusters and crop dust the field with the, with the bacteria. Like the salmon homing in on their breeding grounds using chemical scent, mine technicians are able to use genetically altered microbes to home in on hidden mines. Out here at the test bed, we're using the tractor with the sprayer rig. We could use a sprayer rig in a, a real field operation where we would have it mounted to one of our armored vehicles with steel wheels that goes into an area and then look for detection that way. But it's ideally suited for an aerial platform such as a helicopter or a light airplane. As an end user in the field and someone who has been in the minefields and worked in the minefields, I see the microbe as being one of the most important technologies to come along for detection of landmines in the field. By exposing the chemical trail of a minefield, we can now navigate through one of the most dangerous and explosive environments. When you think about the, the magnitude of this problem, perhaps 100 million landmines still out there, 100 million people that could be killed, maimed, including the children. It's, it's heartbreaking to see that when you, when you see the photos like that in the, in the newspapers. Being able to overcome that problem would just be a phenomenal thing to do. But minefields don't only exist on land. There are whole oceans filled with potential peril. More than 550,000 sea mines were laid during World War II, with more sophisticated mines being set to sea as recently as the conflict in Iraq. It's impossible to know how many latent mines are still in the ocean. While older styles of mines bobbed on or just under the surface, modern sea mines lie deep below on the seabed hidden from view. Newer mines can actually be triggered by sensing that a ship is in the vicinity. So they may listen for the acoustic signal, the sound signal coming from a ship, or they may respond to the magnetic field of a ship, or they may respond to the pressure wave. A system known as Rezon Seabat is revolutionizing the way we see underwater. Traditionally, sonar systems have a single beam pointing vertically to measure depth. The seabat, seen here on trials in Sydney Harbour, sweeps the seabed with 240 sonar beams, building a detailed picture of the sea floor and any hidden dangers. Instead of just having one beam directly below the boat, you have a whole splash of sound across from left to right, and you can get the depth of water across that swath, as we call it. And as a boat travels along, you build up a whole picture of the depth of the seabed. If we know what the seabed consists of, then we can plan strategies for protection against mines if there were a mine threat. Another area is for safety of navigation. It's very important to know how deep the water is. Sydney Harbour is deep enough not to cause any concerns for navigation. But there are still some surprises. The Seabat sonar has revealed the wreck of the Courageon, 
a 600-ton collier, which sank in 1910, when she was rammed by another ship. It's not a threat to shipping or anything like that. It's well out of the way. Seabat sonar is one solution to shallow undersea navigation. But sonar use by submarines can be a deadly giveaway. A new generation undersea navigational tool will give submariners eyes in the darkest of death. The vast oceans of the Earth presents one of the epic navigational challenges for both humans and marine life. The great ocean nomads, for nature, the web, and for humans, the submarine. 6 0 feet, sir. In many ways, remarkably similar in their need to travel safely at times stealthily and accurately. Just keep an eye on those biologics there on the left. Parts of their navigation skills even draw from the same concept. Sonar. Marine mammals migrate in deep water which is often too dark for them to see features on the ocean floor. By using their sonar to view what's around them, they build a mental map defined by the landmarks below them, which helps them find their way to the same winter grounds year after year. Biologic sounds can get so loud out there, especially when uh, whales or dolphins are mating. The sound is so loud, the sonar supervisor, he'll have to take his headphones off and just listen to the screeches and yelps of the animals that are out there. Submarines also use these underwater messages to navigate the ocean depths. Nine zero feet, sir. Passive sonar is just listening. Where active sonar, you have to send out a pulse or some form of energy into the water and then receive back that piece of energy. For a submarine, it's important to use active sonar to determine where the bottom is. We use a fathometer, send a pulse down to the bottom, that signal comes back, we read that based on what we know of the charts. We can tell where the ship is if we get a number of pulses, put all that information together, and we can get, like we get a global positioning fix, we can get a bottom contour fix. For decades, the navigational capabilities of submariners depended on dead reckoning. This system has its limitations. Variations in calculation leads to large errors. Uncharted and shallow waters are dangerous, and sonar is a dead giveaway to the enemy. Both submarines and whales share the same vulnerability. They are forced to surface from time to time, exposing themselves to danger. It's important for submarines to stay stealthy. In order to stay stealthy, completely stealth and undetected, we don't want to be breaking the surface. There are things out there that can detect our antennas, but there's nothing out there that can detect us as long as we stay submerged. Dive submerged ship, make your depth 160 feet. Sub surface to check their reckoning against GPS or star maps after around 150 hours underwater. An impossible task in hostile waters or under the ice cap. What's needed is a navigation system that's accurate and emits no traceable signals. Nature has no 
no such system. But technology has given the Submariner a distinct edge. The latest innovation in navigation for submarines is the use of uh, the gravity field of the Earth. Lockheed Martin has developed a system that uses the Earth's gravitational field to navigate and be able to estimate the terrain, the surrounding terrain of the vehicle. Because gravity is unaffected by the ocean depths, the Universal Gravity Module is able to provide submarines with unprecedented navigational capabilities. The force of uh, gravity changes as you go about the globe. If we had a perfectly smooth, homogeneous sphere, the gravity, uh, the direction of gravity, would be normal to the surface of the Earth, or perpendicular to the surface of the Earth, and it would be constant as we traveled around the surface of the Earth. But unfortunately, that's not the case. We have uh, topographical variations due to hills, mountains, valleys, oceans, rivers, plateaus, and other types of variations and that actually distorts the gravity factor. We actually use that signature to uh, navigate. Now being tested, the Universal Gravity Module allows subs to accurately navigate without approaching the surface. If you were to pull apart this instrument, what you'd see inside is four accelerometers mounted on a common base rotating at a constant frequency. The output of the accelerometers are combined together and signal processing is applied to allow for the gravity measurements. The image is projected in 3D for the first time giving submariners a window on their underwater world. The reason the three-dimensional image is important is because what it does is it, it gives them an image of the surrounding terrain, much like when you're playing a video game and you see the action uh, and you see the terrain or the building that you're in. And right now, submariners do not have that ability to see. There's two main functions that the gravity module employs. That's terrain estimation and passive navigation. It accomplishes these two functions without emanating any signals. So therefore, it's totally covert and it's very, very accurate. Passive navigation allows the submarine to plot its position on the globe. Terrain estimation allows it to accurately depict the terrain it is traveling through. With this type of system, we'll be able to navigate in littoral waters. We'll be able to navigate in enemy harbors and up enemy rivers and uh, essentially have the edge on the enemy. It can map undersea terrain to an accuracy of 30 yards in real time over an area of 42 square miles. Objects such as sea mounts and sea ridges are clearly visible without the use of sonar, a major advantage when hiding from an enemy or navigating uncharted waters. By controlling the viewing angle of the display, the UGM operator can create a 3D display that allows a better navigation. The gravity module has lots of different applications. Not only is it good for navigation, passive covert navigation, it's also an excellent uh, surveyor for minerals and hydrocarbons. Both shipboard and airborne systems have been deployed to date. At the same time we're mastering the dark regions under the sea, we're also beginning to master the dark regions of space and navigate to the stars. As the sun sets at the Anglo-Australian Observatory, astronomers begin working on the most ambitious mapping project ever undertaken. The reason for making these maps is not just to provide future astronauts with a way of finding their way about the galaxies. 
because with the technology that we have today, we don't believe we will ever be able to travel between galaxies. The distances between them are too great. They're measured in hundreds of millions of light years. However, if we can plot the positions of galaxies in large enough numbers in a three-dimensional space, then we can begin to see how they're spread around in the universe, how they're distributed. By mapping the universe in a three-dimensional manner, cosmologists develop a very clear understanding of our expanding universe. There are areas where galaxies clump together in large numbers, which we refer to as clusters, but there are also voids between those clusters. And when you look at these things on the largest possible scales, that's to say on scales of more than about 300 million light years, you start to see that the way galaxies are distributed through the universe is not just clumps and voids, it's actually almost a honeycomb structure. And the galaxies populate the edges of these honeycomb cells. That actually sheds light on the mechanisms that cause the universe to evolve to the shape that we see it today, and in fact, sheds light on the Big Bang itself, the event in which the universe was created about 13 and a half billion years ago. Given the billions of stars in space, scientists have to be precise in targeting galaxies they wish to map. They can pinpoint 150 galaxies at a time. Then a computer-controlled robot aligns a single fiber optic with each galaxy, so only the light from the targets enters the telescope. We allow an electronic robot to pick up the fibers, move them to the right place, and put them down with an accuracy actually of better than one hundredth of a millimeter. So it's much better than doing this by hand. So the robot essentially aligns the fibers with the target galaxies in the sky. So you ignore all the other information and just select the information from those objects. Then you take the plate out of the robot, load it in the telescope, Point the telescope at the correct piece of sky so that the fibers themselves align with the target galaxies. And lo and behold, the light from the galaxies comes down the fibers and we can then analyze it and look for these spectral signatures. From these patterns of light, the depth of galaxies can be determined and a 3D map of space attained. But at 150 galaxies at a time, Cosmologists are just beginning what could be one of the greatest journeys of mankind. You're like a navigator because you are revealing new things. You're making discoveries about the universe that were unknown before in exactly the same way as an explorer would make discoveries about the Earth in a sense that was unknown before you get a, a feeling of elation because your horizons have been broadened, you've seen new things and new worlds in a sense. Learning from the extraordinary sensory world of animals can lead technology to places we've never been. Creating robots which can track their own paths giving surgeons the skills to navigate the human body. Finding our place on the planet and below the seas. Finding our way in the universe.